Hey, so how do you balance your hormones naturally? I'm Dr. Alan Christensen, a board certified naturopathic endocrinologist, and I'm happy to help you make sense out of this. So for starters, what is a hormone imbalance? What does this even mean? It's kind of a funny thing. It's something that to where it's not a formal diagnosis, it's not a disease, and the conventional world can be quick to argue that it's not real, that it doesn't exist. But our hormones are the interplay between our lifestyle and our health. You know, they regulate our bodies and our lifestyle affects our hormones. And they can be in states that are reflective of good health, or if our habits are not conducive to us, our hormones won't be either. And they can be in a state that will cause more symptoms. This can affect our physical health, our mental health, our emotional health. And by hormones, I'm talking here about really the full spectrum. So estrogen, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid hormones, cortisol, insulin, what hormones are, they're regulating molecules. They're made by one part of the body to control the actions of another part. And the, the, the exciting part, the powerful message is that our habits, our lifestyle can change our hormones and our diet can change our hormones. So we can naturally do basic, simple steps and bring them back into a state of healthy balance again. So what are the things that throw them off? Well, in the diet, in terms of the diet, high amounts of sugars, you know, highly refined carbohydrate, highly processed foods, you know, the ultra processed foods, these things disrupt our blood sugar. And in turn, we have to make different amounts of hormones like insulin and cortisol to manage the blood sugar afterward. And the changes in those hormones can affect many symptoms. Other negative dietary factors is just too little fiber, you know, missing out on good phytonutrients, being a low and important essential fats. These are all things that change how the gut flora works and how well the body can produce the regulatory hormones. Other lifestyle factors are just chronic stressors. You know, this is tricky because you can't always ma ma wave a magic wand and change all these facets of your life. But the big stressors are the biggest things, you know, where you are, who you're with, what you do. If those things aren't right, if there's disharmony in some facets of that, they can affect your health like none other. So this is about cortisol and the cortisol rhythm. We need to make this hormone cortisol to start our day, to wake us up, and then we need to shut it off as the day goes along. But in so many cases, that timing becomes disrupted. And when that happens, then all other hormones aren't absorbed into the cells at the right times and in the right amounts. So that's why stress management strategies that regulate cortisol help balance other hormones and improve so many symptoms. A couple more lifestyle factors, sleep, you know, not getting enough sleep. I mentioned about cortisol a moment ago. A big part of how cortisol stays regulated is by melatonin. And we can ingest it, and there's times where it's totally appropriate, but what we make of it is more important and something that can't be replaced through supplemental melatonin. Uh, factors of sleep hygiene, being regular with sleep, allowing time for that, these are big factors. They're, they're critical, and they tie directly into cortisol and also other hormones. There's foods that help as well. So Hormone Healing Cookbook, I talked about the role by which simple foods can directly regulate our output of melatonin and our body's response to that. Last thing to think about as far as things that can disrupt the hormones, environmental toxicants. This is tricky because we're exposed to a lot of things like plastics or chemicals in our personal care products. And these things make our body less able to regulate the hormones in circulation. And that happens because they change how our liver is working. There's certain liver pathways that go about breaking down hormones and conjugating them. But in the presence of environmental toxins, these things don't work properly, and our body can achieve the balance that it likes to. Some easy solutions here are getting a good range of healthy phytonutrients. Cruciferous vegetables are among some of the best that way. They do a really good job helping most of the liver pathways that are the same ones used for regulating our own hormones. So how do we go about regulating this naturally overall? Well, big thing is balancing our diet. I just mentioned the phytonutrient-rich foods, but then also many categories of plant foods. Some examples like oats, they go a long ways towards helping the body to convert hormones properly, make the right byproducts out of those. And I use those in a lot of different ways in the Hormone Healing Cookbook, including some savory recipes. So they're great to work with. Um, regular exercise, this is a big one. So strength training, cardio training, yoga, flexibility work, balance work, they're all important. 
I see many that talk about this type of exercise is good, this type is bad, they're all good. And it's just like a diversified investment portfolio. You want a good range of different types and different types of intensities of exercise. And ideal frequencies would be daily. So if you're not training daily, the closer you get to that, the more benefit that you'll get. The great news, though, is that every incremental amount you add in, there's a measurable benefit from. So wherever you are, you can easily pull the lever of doing a little more and getting greater benefits to your health. Along with exercise, when we think about sleep optimization, so allowing time for sleep, having evening routines that are predictable, doing good basic steps for sleep hygiene, having the room darker at night, making sure the room is cooler at night, being off of electronics for your last hour and a half or so of the day. As soon as you wake up, getting exposure to bright light, either outdoors or with lights that mimic outdoors. These things are all huge. There's easy tricks to add in too, like foods. Um, two that I mentioned in the Hormone Healing Cookbook were cherries and pistachios. Pretty neat. So they actually contain melatonin, but the amount by which they improve our own melatonin is more than would be reflected by what they contain. So they have indirect ways of helping us make it more so than just by giving us some like a supplement does. And then another big thing that we can do on our, on our own is stress management techniques. You know, meditation, mindfulness, breathing exercises, and, and then things like herbal adaptogens, uh, withania, uh, rhodiola. These are compounds that help our body come back to homeostasis, and they can just offset and diminish the overall negative stress response. So what are some big misconceptions to, misconceptions to talk about here? Well, one is that some of the plant foods that I talked about, that these things are dangerous, that they have toxins in them, that we've got to avoid lectins or oxalates or alkaloids or whatnot. And this is tricky. So it's true that plants have toxins. And all the things we talk about being good in plants, like you know the, the pigments in blueberries, for example, or the glucosinolates in broccoli, they're actually toxins. You know, they're, they're pesticides, they're herbicides, they're fungicides. They're things that those plants made to kill plants or insects or fun, fungi. They're, they're pesticides naturally occurring. But the amounts of them that are present and the proportions of them and the context of them, you know, we evolved in harmony with these plant foods. Our bodies are used to them. Our bodies expecting them. And a lot of our chemical pathways only work properly when they're present. So, the saying is that something is a poison or not based upon the dosage, and it's the same way with plant foods. If you look at these contexts, these phytonutrients by themselves, in isolation, in amounts way higher than we'd find in the diet, completely, they could be poisonous. But it's just not like that in the diet. In the amounts in the diet, they're actually helpful. So it takes a little more nuance to see it that way, but that's what our best science tells us. That's why those that consume more fruits and vegetables are healthier than those who did not. They don't have higher rates of autoimmune disease or leaky gut or inflammatory bowel or thyroid disease. They have lower rates of these problems when they consume more fruits and vegetables. So first step is don't be afraid of those. And then also a big thing is don't get too deep into fad diets and restrictive eating. There's often this, this thought that, I don't know, that... A diet should be hard to be effective. And the more hard it is, the more challenging it is, the more powerful it would be. Something seems intuitive about that. And honestly, the opposite is true. Over the decades, I've seen many people who sadly try really hard to get healthy. And by trying hard, they restrict extremely. They cut out a lot of food categories. They make it difficult. They don't get healthy. You know, your body becomes lower in essential nutrients. Your gut flora is compromised. There's negative psychological repercussions in terms of how you feel about the things you need to survive. And there's negative effects upon the apparatuses of the digestive function. You know, the fewer, fewer foods you eat, the fewer foods you can tolerate. So it's better to have a wide range of healthy foods. There are times to where targeted things should be avoided. We think about certain short-term food allergies, about targeting iodine levels for certain windows of time. There's totally examples of that, but they should be done cautiously and for a reason, you know, for a season, you know, not forever, and they shouldn't stack on top of one another. So be very cautious about restrictive steps towards one's diet. Some key steps to make all this work well, you know, keep keep an eye on symptoms and how they align with hormonal changes. Uh, if you're menstruating, you know, monthly changes. As we age, think about changes with age. And it's good to be aware of measuring hormones and being aware of how they're shifting and how that might correlate with your how you're feeling. 
One of the easiest natural ways to improve them, though, is with food. And I wrote the Hormone Healing Cookbook with all the science present about how to best go about doing that. Just simple everyday foods and the right amounts and the right combinations can be chosen to target particular hormone symptoms, and they've been clinically proven to make a good difference. So it's not about cutting things out. It's about adding things in specifically. And then also partnering with healthcare practitioners who feel like you do, who feel that natural treatments are better and they're able to and educated to support you with natural ways to go about identifying where your hormones are and balancing them so they're at a better state. These are the big steps that can work for balancing hormones naturally, and it's entirely doable and it's well worth it. All right, Dr. Christensen with you. Do something helpful today, you know, one more step than you've done before in the past, and we'll talk again soon.